Good morning. Welcome to the Spencerville Church. We're so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today, and I pray that wherever you are, that God is blessing you. I want to say hello to the Wheatons that are watching down in Tennessee. I got a message from them last week that they have made Spencerville Church their church home, and we're so appreciative of that. There might be others of you around the country, around the world, that would like to make Spencerville actually your true home. We would love to connect with you. Of course, we want you to connect with your local church, but we know for some of you that is not possible. And so if you are looking for a church home, whether you are here locally in the Silver Spring area or you are somewhere else in the United States or even in the world, we would love to be your church. Even once we go back in person, we are going to continue to, to nurture this relationship with our uh, online, our, our virtual community. And we want to grow that and to, to minister to you as best as we can in this distance type of setting. Uh, this morning, we had our second in-person service, and we're looking to do that again in two weeks. It was outdoors, uh, a bit chilly, but God blessed. And so we hope that if you weren't able to be at this one, that you will consider coming to joining us for our next in-person gathering, which... Hopefully the weather will continue to hold and we'll be able to have outdoors. Uh, today, I'm excited because our special guest that we have with us will be doing prayer in just a moment, and that is Matthew Piersanti, our new uh, youth pastor. He's in town for just a couple days. He and his wife are looking for a place to live. Uh, and so I want you to all please be in prayer that they find the right place that God will open the doors to the right place and provide uh, the avenue for them to get a place where they can grow their, their family of five. They're Amy and, and Matthew have three little boys and that they will be uh, blessed here in their ministry uh, in the Spencerville area. So, so keep that in prayer and you'll see Matthew in just a moment praying, but we're so glad to have uh, he and Amy here in town again for a couple days to, to say hello and to meet them face to face for our staff for the first time and to get to know them a little better. And we're excited about the ministry that they have. Uh, hopefully, we don't know for sure because there's some transitions from Canada to the United States, but hopefully they will be joining us by mid-November. But today, whatever's going on in your life, whatever your week has entailed, I pray that, that, that if it's good, that this will just be a confirmation, this will be a celebration of God's blessing. If it's been rough that, that, that spending this time focusing on Jesus will be help put that stuff aside for a little while. But whatever it may be, I pray that God will speak to your heart in some way. Maybe it'll be through the prayers. Maybe it'll be through the, the children's story. Maybe it'll be through the singing or through the spoken word. But let us each one ask Jesus to speak to our hearts right now as we sing together our hymn of praise.
I just want to invite you to join me for our pastoral prayer. So if you're in the kitchen, just take a pause. If you'd like to join me on your knees, you can do that as well. But let's draw near to God together as we pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for this Sabbath to worship you and to spend time in your presence wherever we are. We ask for a special blessing for your Holy Spirit to speak to us through the words of our pastor and to touch us in the place in our lives that we need to hear from you the most. Lord, I want to lift up those who are sick in our congregation, those who are hurting, those who are lonely, those who are suffering. And I just ask, Father, that you would draw near to them in the way that you think best. And Lord, continue to bless our nation and our country in a time like this. And please continue to bless our families and our children. And we just thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy and your grace towards us especially uh, for that sacrifice you made on the cross so long ago. And we just thank you, Father, for this time that we can spend together online with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. It is time for your special time, so come in closer because I have a story I want to tell you. How many of you, if given a choice, like to stay clean. Yeah, I see, okay. How many of you like to get really dirty? Yeah? You know, a couple years ago, one of the big detergent companies had a contest to see who was the dirtiest kid in America. And there were a whole bunch of kids who entered that contest. Now, I have to admit, when I was a kid, I was in that first group. I liked to stay clean. I had four brothers, and they would like to go out and wrestle out in the dirt, but I preferred to stay inside and play with my dolls and, and stay clean. Now, in my family, I was the only one who chose to go to church with my grandmother. And my grandmother liked to take little girls to church who looked pretty and clean. One particular year, she bought me a dress that was all white with a white lace collar and a lavender satin sash. Now she wanted me to have lavender tights to match, but she couldn't find them in the store, so she went out and bought dye and dyed them herself so that I had lovely lavender tights to match my lovely lavender sash. And when I slipped on my white patent leather shoes, I thought that I looked like a princess. Well, I went to church that day, and after church, we, I was invited over to a friend's house to spend the afternoon. Now, back in those days, children stayed in their church clothes most of the day. And while the adults were fixing lunch, we went outside and we were playing very nicely. Now, one of my friends said, hey, 
let's go across the field. I want to show you something. Well, I didn't really want to go because I didn't want to get dirty, but they were all going, so I thought, well, I'll just be very careful. But they had all gotten ahead of me, and as, as I was looking ahead to, to see where they were going, I wasn't watching my feet, and all of a sudden, I stepped into a mushy, mushy puddle of thick black mud up to my ankles. I was so embarrassed and I was so ashamed and I didn't know where to go and I didn't want my friends to see. And so I started heading back to the house. My friend Sharon saw what had happened and she knew that I was really upset. And she says, come on, let's go find Aunt Liddy. Aunt Liddy will know what to do. Dear Aunt Liddy, she pulled off my black shoes and helped me peel off my wet tights. I don't know how she cleaned the shoes, but she put them back on my feet and she says, okay, go and play. I'm going to go work on your tights. And somehow she put those tights in the sink and scrubbed them and scrubbed them and then laid them out in the sun. And by the time I went home, I was clean again and smiling. You know, sometimes we get dirty when we don't mean to get dirty. Sometimes we're playing with other kids and even though we're trying to be careful, we get in the mud. That happens with dirt and it happens with sin. We really try to be good. We really want to make good choices, but sometimes we just don't. When other kids are making choices and doing things that our moms and dads asked us not to do, it's sometimes it's hard to, to, to be that person that our mom or our dad wants us to be. And sometimes we end up making bad choices and, and feeling ashamed. But the good news is that even better than Aunt Liddy, Jesus is always there to make us clean again. You know, he is the only one who can get the stains out. He is the only one who can make the muddy things pure and white again. Jesus is wanting to take home all of his children clean once again. But you know, we have to remember that the only way we can be clean like that is when Jesus does the washing.
When I moved from Southern California to Ohio in the midst of my high school years, I discovered a culture in Ohio that was very different, very unfamiliar to what I had grown up in California. My peers in California, we could say, were a little more wise to the ways of the world. And, and in Ohio, I discovered a naivety that, at that time at least, that was surprising, uh, unfamiliar, that caught me off guard. For the first two years of my time there in Ohio, I would excuse, I would use the culture of California, the culture of my upbringing to excuse certain aspects of my behavior, the things I would say, even in some ways the beliefs that I had. Whether externally or internally, at times I would, I would say, like I said, sometimes outwardly or sometimes in my own head, well, this is how we did it in California, or, or this is the way we, we think in California. That's just who I am, I would say. Psychology agrees with, with this sentiment that I was expressing there as a teenager in high school agrees with the sentiment that we are simply products of our environment and there's not much we can do about it. Dr. Nathan Heflick, a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of London in the United Kingdom, writing for Psychology Today, said the following. He said, we wind up believing in and supporting to a large extent what we are pretty much told to believe and value by our culture and our subsectional membership within the culture. Thus, Hefleck continues, if culture and society shape all of our beliefs, then from what religious perspective, then from a religious perspective, what does this suggest? Hefleck believes this suggests the following. He says, every belief is therefore equal. Every person can determine their own beliefs and no one should state otherwise or superiority over another's beliefs. In many ways, I lived out Dr. Heflick's theory in a way when I moved from California to Ohio. I'm a product of California, therefore this is who I am. Take it or leave it. You should not judge. It is the overriding worldview of a great majority of our society today, uh, especially within each subsequent generation. It's being being taught and, and impressed more and more upon the minds of individuals through the various aspects of culture. It is a worldview affirmed by the way we live. It's a worldview affirmed by psychology. It's a worldview affirmed by our education system. And it is a worldview that was prophesied by the Bible itself. You want to open your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses three and four. And the Bible tells us this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, I mean sound doctrine in some of your verse, versions say, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And it is this issue that the church in Pergamum in Asia Minor was dealing with centuries ago when Jesus wrote them the following letter. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12. Revelation 2 and chapter verse 12. Again, to remind you, maybe this is the first time you've been joining us or you haven't joined us for a while. We are in the midst of a series entitled Seven Pictures, and we're looking at seven pictures uh, based on the seven letters written to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And and these, these, these letters address things that were happening within the culture of those churches in their time, in their day. They address things that were happening over the course of history. But, but they also address, as Sig Tonstead said, they address just humanity throughout the ages and the struggle that we face and as we approach the end of time. And we're looking really at that from this, that standpoint. That, that these seven pictures help us to understand who God's people will be, a picture of who God's people will be in 
the last days. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, and I'm just going to read the whole letter to you. And to the messenger of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have, he says, Jesus writes to them, a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some amongst you who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. A letter to the church of Pergamum. Jesus describes the place where the church of Pergamum exists, the city of Pergamum, as Satan's throne. What did Jesus mean by this? Well, Pergamum was a, was a center of pagan worship. Uh, they were abundant in pagan worship, and not just one pagan deity, but, but a multitude of deities. The cult of Asclepius, the serpent god of healing, had its temple headquarters there. Zeus had a temple there in, in Pergamum. Athene, Demeter, and Dionysius were also gods receiving a, a, a tremendous amount of accolades and significant cultic attention in Pergamum. It was the first city in Asia Minor to build a temple to a Roman ruler. They built a temple when Augustus, Caesar Augustus, was the ruler. And the capital for the whole area of the cult of the emperor was there in Pergamum. The city proudly referred to itself as the temple warden, meaning they, they were the protectors of emperor worship. The refusal to pay public homage to Caesar as a deity meant high treason to the state. Jesus draws attention in, in the passage to a man by the name of Antipas who was killed for being a faithful witness to Jesus in this city. But in this one verse, verse 13, Jesus creates this, this tension. Jesus begins the verse by saying, I know where you dwell referring to this city as the place where they dwell. But then at the end of the verse, Jesus says, this is also where Satan dwells. Jesus does this to contrast the idea that, and, and to show us that, that light and darkness are there in the same city, but, but we're going to see that Jesus says that these two things, light and darkness, cannot dwell together in peaceful coexistence. And while Pergamum, the church in Pergamum, has been faithful in many ways, they now are faced with a dilemma. Will they, will they compromise according to the doctrines that are coming in, the teachings that are coming into their church due to their surrounding culture? Or will they stand for God's truth no matter what? And another way of saying that is, will they let the, the air of the world come into their midst and push out the truth of God? In Ephesus, the issue was that the people had been so focused on, on doctrinal purity. You might remember from our very first sermon in this sermon series that, that, that the people in Ephesus had been so focused on doctrinal purity, they'd been so focused on what they knew and, and, and adding to their knowledge that they neglected their witness outside of their walls. They cared about protecting themselves and creating a hedge around themselves and they neglected to continue to be witnesses for Jesus beyond their walls. But, but Pergamum is actually in the opposite boat. They have still continued to, to be witnesses in many ways. They've still even continued to, to proclaim the name of Jesus beyond their walls. But they have de-emphasized the importance of truth inside of their walls. They are at risk of of over-identifying with the teachings of the world as they are trying to mingle amongst the city they're in. 
the Christians in Pergamum staunchly withstood external pressures to compromise from pagan authorities, but, 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 but the text seems to imply that they had apparently permitted a subtle form of compromise to develop internally. In verse 14 of chapter 2, Jesus said this, But I have this against you, a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrificed idols, and practice sexual immorality. This is speaking of, it's, this is referencing a Bible story. This is what Revelation does over and over again. The best way to understand Revelation is to know the rest of the Bible because it's referring to a time period in Israel's history when, when they were saying that they were following God and desiring to follow God and, and yet at the same time, they were also trying to dabble in the pagan way of living. This was, Balaam was an individual that, that was supposedly loyal to God, but still wanted to compromise a little bit and enjoy the, the experience of the world and the culture around him. Verse 15, so you also have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans amongst you. Who are these two groups? One is, of course, described in the story as, as similar to the story of Balaam and Balak, but, but there's also the Nicolaitans. But who are these two groups right then and there? I like the way that that the commentator William Barclay describes them succinctly and understandably. These are believers. Remember, these are people that are in their church. These are people that are members that are part of their church. These are believers that sought to persuade Christians that there was nothing wrong with prudent conformity to the world's standards. Now, let's be honest. Do we not also see this issue in our midst as well, even now? Do we maybe not even sense this in our own hearts? Not even looking at others or judging others, but, but do we not even sense this in our own hearts? Those moments where we say this, this isn't really that big of a deal, where, where we, we let our friends, our culture dictate to us what we believe. Well, the Bible says this, but that just doesn't feel right. And so, or my friends think this way, and so I'm going to go with that. Jesus tells us through the church of Pergamum, through this letter to the church of Pergamum, that it doesn't matter where you live or what the world says truth is. It doesn't matter that there's other truths that seem attractive to you, that, that there is still a standard of truth. There is still a, a, a measure of truth. And what is that, that truth? It is described to us in the description of Jesus. The description of Jesus that comes at the beginning of this letter, verse 12. Revelation 2 and verse 12. And to the angel or to the messenger of the church of, in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Just as I said a minute ago, uh, the Bible refers us back to other parts of Scripture for us to understand. Revelation refers us back to other parts of Scripture to understand what it is speaking of. And the description of Jesus draws our attention to another Scripture in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And you're welcome to turn there with me as well. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged Sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. For the word of God is a living two-edged sword. This is talking about the scriptures, the Bible, the teachings of God's word. Jesus tells the church in Pergamum that, that he comes to them based on the truth of scripture. And he's saying, in your midst, there's, there's some compromise about truth. You're saying, well, well, this truth maybe doesn't matter, or this truth maybe doesn't matter. And, and Jesus is saying, this is the standard, not the culture in which you live, not, not the people around you, not what we think is truth. And Jesus tells the church in Pergamum that this is what they will be judged by. This is the standard by that which they will be judged by. Again, not, not what 
we think is truth, but, but what the Word of God says. Verse 16 there in the book of Revelation chapter 2. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them. I believe he's saying he war against the air in their midst with the sword of my mouth. Jesus starts this message to the people of Pergamum with a reference to the truth of God, the two-edged sword. He ends his warning with a reference to the word of God being the standard by, against, by which we'll be judged. And in between, he tells them and he tells us, it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what the culture says is truth. It doesn't even matter what some within your midst, amongst your own believers, have said is truth and, and say that it's okay to prudently compromise with. The truth is the Word of God, the Bible, the Scriptures. And in the last days, God is, is looking for a people that will take their stand for Jesus' truth, to not tolerate the culture's truth, to not... To not look for opportunity to embrace the air that is in the world. Remember that passage I read from 2 Timothy chapter 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into mist. There will come a time in the last days when people will say, this is truth, or this is truth, or this is truth. As Heflick said in that article in Psychology Today, based on the idea that culture largely defines our truth, who can say that this view is superior to another, or that this truth is, is, is more truth than another? As he says, no one can say that based on the idea that culture defines our truth. But Jesus is saying in the last days, there will be a people that will live in a culture that will define truth in an entirely different way. And yet he will have a people that will say, my truth is still based on the two-edged sword, the word of God. The word of God. Now I have to make a point here and I think that it is a, a vital point. Right now, in these days in which we are living, I can't stand on God's word if I don't know it. In the future, when more troubling times are coming, I can't stand on God's word if I don't know it. My truth will be defined by my culture and my subcultures even if I do not stand on the Word of God. Will you do a quick little exercise with me? Organize in your mind the, the following activities from most time spent to, to least time spent. Uh, time on, the first one is time on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat. The second is, is watching television, just TV shows that are that are out there, or I don't even know if people watch television anymore, maybe watching Netflix or, or, or Amazon Prime or Disney Plus or whatever it may be. Watching sports, following the, the political debate that is going on in our nation. And then the fifth one, reading the Bible. Of those, order those in your mind as to from from most to least, which do you spend the most time participating in and which do you spend the least time participating in? If the Bible is below any of those other four, then we need to, we need to wake up because we are in danger of follow, falling into the trap of Pergamum. We need to pray for God to give us a heart for the Word of God that, that we will make that a higher priority than any of those other four things. Here's why. Social media will not prepare you for Jesus' second coming. Television will not prepare you for, for Jesus' second coming or, or streaming through your computers will not prepare you for Jesus' second coming. Sports will not prepare us for Jesus' second coming. Uh, the political debate 
aligning ourselves with a particular political party will not prepare us for Jesus' second coming. And in fact, all four of those have the potential to move us into the sphere of the church of Pergamum. Doctrinal compromise. Truth compromise. It is only the Bible. It is only the Bible that can truly prepare us for the second coming of Jesus. We're not, we're not saved by reading the Bible, but the Bible does help us to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And we must have a relationship with Jesus in order to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. Do you want to be ready for the second coming of Jesus? I know that I do. I know that you do as well. That comes with having a relationship with him having Jesus living in me, having faith in Jesus, having trust in Jesus. And we are told that we can know Jesus, that, that the best way to get to know Jesus is through this book. Psalm chapter 119 and verse 11 tells us, uh, reads in this way, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Some of your versions say, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. John chapter 17 and verse 17, Jesus' prayer in the garden of Gethsemane just before he died, Jesus prayed this for you and for me and for all humanity throughout history. Make them holy, and he says this to, to God, he prays this to his Father, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. That's from the New Living uh, Translation. Some of yours says, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So faith, speaking of faith in Jesus, comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. All those verses are talking about the importance of the Bible. We know that sin leads us away from Jesus. The Bible tells us sin separates us from God. But the Bible, but the, the scripture tells us that, that the Bible storing God's word in our heart helps to protect us against sin. Now, just knowing it is not going to protect us against sin, but, but if we allow it to, to, to pierce down to the intentions of our heart, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we allow Jesus to dwell in us. We want to be like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus every day. Sometimes when I when I talk to my kids, I think to myself, Man, Jesus would never talk to me that way. He's so much more loving than I am. When I get impatient with Christine, I think to myself, man, if Jesus got impatient with me as I get sometimes with my wife, I'd be in so much trouble. When, 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 when I get distracted by the, the debate that happened this week, I think, man, if Jesus got distracted by every time someone went a little crazy out there, then we'd be in a lot of trouble. He'd never get anything done. There's all these things. I want to be more like Jesus. And Jesus prayed. He said, Lord, sanctify them. Make them holy like me. You'll do this as, you, as they understand your truth. We know that we'll need faith to stand for Jesus in the last days. We need faith for Jesus to stand for Jesus right now. And I gain this faith from hearing Jesus through his truth, the word of God. I want to be ready for Jesus' second coming. I want to be one of those persons in the last days that, that, that stands for Jesus' truth. He says, you're living in a horrible place. The world is decaying all around you. He said that to the church of Pergamum. He says that to us as well. And he said, but it doesn't matter where you live. You still have those in your midst. You're still, you're still tempted by this cultural view. Get rid of it. Choose to make your truth the truth of the word of God. So let's pray for each other. Let's pray to be a people starting right now that will be committed to the Bible as the the absolute truth over all other ideas. Not our culture, not our friends, not even our own feelings. The Bible, 
as the absolute truth. Not because the Bible saves us, but because the Bible helps us to connect to the one who does save us. The Bible connects us to the one who will give us a new name. The Bible connects us to the one who will feed us with the manna from heaven. The Bible connects us to the one who loves us, who died for us, who is preparing a place for us out of the mess of this world. Let us pray. Jesus, help me, help us, Jesus, convict us, convict every heart listening to these words right now to make opening your Bible and reading it and internalizing it the highest priority of every day of our lives. Lord, make it a joy for us to study your word, not for knowledge alone, but, but that, that, that as we understand who you are, as we get a beautiful picture of who you are in scripture, that we come to understand how much you love us and what a delight it is to love and to serve you. Jesus, we want to be ready for your second coming. We won't be judged by what we think is right or what we think is truth, but, but according to your words, according to your truth. Jesus, I pray, cover us with your righteousness and give us a heart for you and your truth in this world that is growing more and more corrupt and more and more in air with each passing day. I thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering this prayer. In your name we pray. Amen.
us pray. So now, Jesus, we pray that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always that we will seek to do good to one another and to everyone. We pray that we will rejoice always and that we will pray without ceasing, that we will give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. We pray that we will not quench the spirit nor despise the prophecies, but that we will test everything, holding fast to that which is good and abstaining from every form of evil. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.